Hello again and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about core action value number eight, vision, which is giving form to that sense of purpose that we talked about last time. Jonathan Swift said, vision is the art of seeing the invisible. Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, you can do it. You know, we humans are the only ones who have that ability to see the future. Uh, one of the exercises we give people is we'll give people a t-shirt and on the back it says this, define your future by your hopes and not by your fears, by your dreams and not by your memories. And then what we do, and you can do this, you don't have to have a t-shirt, although it's best on a t-shirt, you could do it on a piece of paper or anything. Draw a picture of your dream on that t-shirt, right on the front. Uh, I have a whole drawer full of them. Everything from a t-shirt that has a picture of values coach 10 years from now with people all over the world to a pool table because that happens to be one of my little personal dreams. Put that t-shirt on every day. And I'll tell you about a guy who did. I was working with a group and this guy drew a picture on the front of his t-shirt and it was a picture of a farm. This beautiful red barn, the green John Deere tractor, dog running in the yard, the corn stalks in the background. And he said, this picture is the family farm. And he said, my dad passed away. My brothers don't want a farm. I don't know how I can keep the farm and the family. I'm afraid we're going to lose it all. And so I gave him an assignment after he had drawn his picture. I said, every day you wear this t-shirt, wash it now and then, but every day you wear this t-shirt underneath whatever costume you wear to work. When you put it on, you say to yourself five times, the family farm stays in the family. Say it like you mean it. The family farm stays in the family. And then you make a commitment every single day. You're going to do at least two things to keep the farm in the family. It could be little things or it could be big things. You're going to call another bank that you haven't called yet and talk to them about a mortgage. You're going to talk to another neighbor about investing in the business of your farm. You're going to forego um, a piece of chocolate pie and you're going to put the $1.50 that you saved in a, a, a tin that says family farm fund. About a year and a half later, I got a call from a very emotional man and he choked up for a bit and then he said, Mr. Ty, the family farm has stayed in the family. Today, I signed the bank papers. And I asked him, I said, do you think it would have happened but for the t-shirt? And he said, the t-shirt was the turning point. Once I started changing my thinking, once I kept my vision focused on keeping the family farm in the business instead of agonizing over we're going to lose the family farm, it gave me the hope, optimism, and the courage to do the things I had to do to keep the family farm in the family. When you have a vision, when vision becomes a value, it's like you got this toolkit. And imagine these tools. The first tool it gives you is a compass. You know, this guy with the family farm, that was his true north. He didn't veer off into a whole lot of other things. He didn't, you know, it kept him from watching a lot of TV because he was working on trying to keep the family farm and the family. It kept him focused on his true north. Uh, it's a magnifying glass. When you're clear about your vision, when you have a big goal, every act is magnified because you are so focused on what it is you want to do. And the, and the work that you do complements itself. So you read something over here and you say, oh, that's how I can use that here. It's a magnet. When you have a big dream, it attracts people into your circle. It attracts the resources you need. Um, it's a flywheel. You know, in a car, a flywheel is a big, heavy metal disc that spins around. So in between, when the pistons are going bang, 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 it keeps the, like you see in the old movies, you see the cars going boom, and they don't do that anymore. That's because the flywheel smooths out the momentum. You're going to have days where you're not going to have energy, where you're going to be depressed, where it's going to feel like everything's falling apart, and that vision, that dream will pull you through. It'll keep your momentum going the way a flywheel does in a car. And finally, my favorite metaphor, it's a, a spark plug. A big dream helps you spark yourself, helps you motivate yourself, and that's what vision is all about. Now, there, there's a, a paradox, actually three paradoxes, that go with having a big dream. And here's the first one. A big dream is sometimes more likely to be achieved than a tiny little one or a timid little one. Great example. When Millard Fuller started Habitat for Humanity, his goal was no more shacks 
anywhere in the world. And they've built millions of homes all around the world since then. What if his dream had been no more shacks in America's Georgia? And once we get poverty housing in America's Georgia taken care of, we'll move to the whole state, and then we'll move on to South Carolina, and they'd still be in Georgia today. It was the magnificence, the audacity of that big dream that gave him those tools that attracted the resources, the people he needed to have to make it go, that inspired him. Second is that sometimes a big dream has no more risk than a little dream. For the entrepreneur starting a business who mortgages off the house, you can only lose your house once. <laughs> Whether you're starting a shoe store or Zappos.com, they can only take your house away one time. And so you might as well think bigger. And the third paradox is that no matter how big your vision is, no matter how big your dream is, once you've accomplished it, what you realize is very often it's just the platform for an even bigger dream. There's never been a bigger dreamer in our world than Walt Disney. The man who said, if you can dream it, you can do it. And then he did it and he did it. And yet the big dreams he had, Disney World and Orlando being the biggest of his dreams, have just been the platform for something that he probably wouldn't even recognize today, this incredible worldwide Disney empire. And that, those are the paradoxes when you let yourself have a big dream. One more thing before we talk about the cornerstones. You can be a visionary with your vision on the future. You can be a victim focused on the past, all the bad things that have happened to you, but you can't be both. And it's a choice you make. Do you want to be a victim dragging around the dead weight of the past, complaining about all the bad things that have happened to you and making all the excuses, well, I can't because... Or do you want to be a visionary, keeping that mind's eye in the future on what the possibilities are? It's a choice, but you can't do both. And it begins with cornerstone number one, attention. I love to do this when I'm speaking some, and with a small group in a workshop. I'll go around the room, ask people if they'll give me $100. <laughs> As you could imagine, very few people are willing to pull out their wallet and give me $100. And then I'll walk around the room and say, how about eight hours of your time? And of course, they're halfway into doing that. And the point is, if you are half as attentive as how you give away four or eight hours as you are how you give away a $20 bill, you would make much better use of your time. What you choose to pay attention to is the platform upon which you build your vision for the future. One of the most important choices you make all day. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, a man becomes what he thinks about all day long. And he wasn't the first to think of that. He was actually quoting something that came from the Bible 2,000 years or more earlier. Pay attention to what you pay attention to. When I ask you for your attention, I don't say, hey, can I borrow your attention? I say, pay attention because it won't come back. And here's a very simple, practical, simple but not necessarily easy, practical strategy. I call it be today, see tomorrow. Keep your attention in the immediate present. That's the secret of happiness. You know, as we talked about earlier, um, when you're feeling emotional anguish, it's usually because your attention is in the past or out in the future. P keep your attention in the present. Be mindful to what's going on around you. But keep your vision, that dream of your tomorrow, in the future. And not just any future, the future you want it to be. And it takes a little bit of mental toughness. And you've got to be tough with yourself to do that. If you can, you'll be a lot happier and you'll be a lot more successful. Pay attention. The second cornerstone is imagination. If you can dream it, you can do it. And I absolutely believe this. You can remember the future more clearly and more accurately than you can remember the past. And I'll challenge you with it. First, try to remember something that happened in your past. Your second birthday, the, the cake, uh, the, the song, the presents, and I'll bet you anything, that memory's gone, even though you know that actually happened. Now, think about where you're going to be this time three days from now, what you're doing, who you're with, what you're wearing. Chances are you can have a pretty good mental picture of that. You can remember three days from now, even though it technically hasn't happened yet. Why is it that we can remember something that hadn't happened yet? Well, it's going to be a lot like yesterday was. 
And part of the art of being successful in your life, in your work, pursuing your dreams and goals, is the ability to remember a tomorrow, a next week, next month, next year, that's somehow different than yesterday. We worked with a hospital in Page, Arizona for a while. And one day I'm driving into Page, coming up from Cameron. It's a beautiful drive in through the desert. I look off to the left, and there are these beautiful cliffs, except where they, they weren't the last time I was there are a bunch of big, ugly, yellow caterpillar tractors gouging a hole in the ground. I got to the hospital. Later that day, I'm talking to someone, and I say, what are they, what are they digging a hole out there for? And the, the other individual said, oh, that's going to be the new super Walmart. Now, for better or worse, for better and worse, the chances of that hole in the ground stopping at that point were zero. Somewhere in Bentonville, Arkansas, on a desk, there was a plan, there was a blueprint, there was a budget, there was a timetable for that super Walmart. It was, in somebody's mind, not just a wish, not hope, a fantasy, it was a memory of the future. And that's a great metaphor. When you have a plan, a budget, a timetable, a set of specific goals, and you're holding yourself accountable, your dreams can become your memories of the future. And let's talk a little bit about vision and visualization. Vision is a noun. It's the end product. It's a picture. My vision of the house, the business, whatever it is. Visualization is a, is a verb. It is the process of thinking through that um, uh, how you achieve that noun, that outcome. And there's an interplay between the two. You have your initial vision. So if, say it's a house or a building of some sort. The first vision is the rough drawing of what it's going to look like, the rendering. And then you visualize yourself walking through it. It gets a little more clear. You got a more clear picture. There's an interplay between the two. And thinking about that, you know, don't settle for the first vision. Do something, build a prototype, play with it, walk through it, you know, lay it out on the ground. Then you come back and you have a stronger vision. And I was actually just reading something the other day that struck me. There's um, been some recent research on the power of visualization. And there are two kinds of visualization. And this is really important. There's outcome visualization and there's process visualization. Outcome visualization, you know, some of the, the new age gurus say, you know, visualize money coming into your life, visualize yourself as you want to be. And that's a good thing. But process visualization is, pro is more effective, according to the research and, and, and my own personal experience. And that is visualize yourself doing it. Confidence is seeing yourself do something. Every athlete who's ever won a race or won a game or won an event has won it at least twice. Once they run the race in their mind, step by step by step, they visualize the entire race, the entire course, the entire game in their mind before they play it out in the world. Um, if you're a writer, every night before you go to bed, as you're going to bed, visualize yourself getting up in the morning, making your coffee, laying out your paper or your keyboard or whatever, setting your notes. If that's the last thing you're visualizing in the, in the, at night, you're much more likely to get up in the morning and, and step right into that habit, that ritual that helps you work your way toward whatever your dream is. Imagine yourself, see yourself doing it, then imagine yourself, see yourself having it done. The next cornerstone is articulation. Um, a dream is, um, goes nowhere if you haven't shared it with somebody else. There are very few people who can all by themselves make their dream happen. You have to be able to describe it in such a way that somebody else can buy into it. And when I talked about remembering the future, and I really do believe you can create memories of the future, one of the tools that we share in this course, call it the five A's, the letter A, of a memory of the future. And it begins with art, the root word of articulation. You have to be able to somehow convey to somebody else in a blueprint, in a drawing or a painting. You know, the original business plan for Southwest Airlines was on the back of a cocktail napkin. It's a little triangle, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio. And Herb Kelleher was looking at that. And that, that uh, napkin is now 
in, in plexiglass at the Southwest Airlines Museum. But it was articulating a dream in such a way that other people could see it. The t-shirt that I talked about, the family farm stays in the family, that was articulating a dream in a certain way. The second A is affirmation. Because we dream in pictures, we have that picture of what it's going to look like, but we worry in words. So as soon as you have that picture of your beautiful new house, probably there's going to be a little voice in the back of your head saying, you can't afford the mortgage you have now. How are you going to pay for that monstrosity? And that's when you have to have verbal affirmation to override that negative self-talk. The family farm stays in the family. Don't tell me it can't happen. The family farm stays in the family. You need to have, you need to rewrite that inner dialogue to reinforce and support your dreams of the future. The third A is ask. You have to be willing to ask for help. Guy with the family farm staying in the family. Every day I told him to do two things and many of the things that he did were asking other people for help. Going to a bank and asking for a bigger mortgage. Going back to a bank that had said no and saying, I've saved a little more money. What's the answer now? Uh, asking a neighbor to help. Uh, being willing, asking for advice. You've got to be willing to ask for what you need. The fourth A, without which the others are wasted, is act. Remember, positive thinking is expecting something and working to make it happen. Wishful thinking is hoping for something, visualizing it, and then waiting for someone else to do it for you. You have to be willing to act on your dreams. That means taking risk. That's why we started with courage earlier. It takes courage to take action in many cases. But finally, the, the fifth A is adapt. The world's going to change. You're going to change. You know, it, uh, it's been demonstrated a majority of startup businesses five years out are in an almost completely different line of business than what they started in. You know, you start a business, you start working on a book, you start something. You know, many kids go to school and they change their majors. The world changes, you change, you have to be willing to adapt. Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind. And that's really good advice. But if you're too focused on a specific end, I'm going to be a doctor by golly, and, and third year in a medical school you realize, it's not really what I want. You have to be willing to adapt and flow with where your imagination, where your dreams take you. And that gets me to the fourth cornerstone of vision, which is belief. I said, Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, you can do it. Napoleon Hill, one of the first self-help classic writers, uh, wrote a book called Think and Grow Rich. And in, in that book he said, what the mind can conceive, dream up, and believe it can achieve. And that's the essential ingredient. If you don't believe in yourself, if part of authenticity, if you don't believe in your dreams, if you're not really firmly um, convinced that you can make this happen, you can keep the family farm in the family, whatever it is, it's going to be much less likely you're going to achieve it. Wayne Dyer wrote a, book, a whole book about this topic, and he took the, the saying we, we, we've all heard, I'll, see it, I'll believe it when I see it. He turned that on his head. You'll see it when you believe it. When you believe something, um, you're much more likely to achieve it. And where does belief start? It starts with being willing to suspend disbelief. You know, when you go into a, a movie, when you go to watch a movie about dinosaurs or when you read a, a spy novel, you have to be willing to let go of disbelief. You've got, is what fiction writers call it, suspending disbelief. You have to do the same thing for yourself. That little voice in the back of your head is going to tell you, you can't do it. You've got to be willing to suspend that and see what happens. There's a wonderful TED video, which you may have seen in this, your, your values trainer may have showed you. If not, go look it up yourself. It's called How to Start a Movement, a little three and a half minute video. And there's a young entrepreneur named Derek Sievers, and he talks about how a movement gets started. And how's it get started? First, you got the lone nut, the person who really believes he or she can change the world. And then you get a, a few first followers coming along. Those are the people who really have to believe in what they're doing, really have to believe in the importance of changing the world, really have to believe that despite all the disbelief all around them, have to believe that it's possible. So let me, let me leave you with one last exercise that can be a very powerful, can be a life-changing exercise. It's going to sound silly at first, 
You know, a lot of people read their own horoscopes. You, you open the newspaper or open a fortune cookie, whatever, and there's your fortune, there's your horoscope. Why on earth would you trust a perfect stranger to write something as important as your fortune or your horoscope? Why not write it yourself? And that's what I'm advising you to do. Give it three months. Every morning, better yet, every night before you go to bed, takes about two minutes. Write your horoscope for the next day. Not a to-do list, not a goal list, a horoscope. So my horoscope for tomorrow might read, it's going to be a beautiful day. You're going to meet some wonderful people. You're going to have a chance to touch somebody in a way that uh, helps them be more effective in their own personal life. A great business opportunity is going to come from out of the blue. But it's not going to be real obvious that's what it is. So pay attention to everybody you meet and call your mom and have a nice day. Now, that's a pretty good horoscope. And here's my promise. If you do this for three months, just every night before you go to bed, write your own horoscope, you will be astonished at the things that start happening to you. As you start paying attention, as you start getting more clear about what would my perfect day look like. So that's, that's, that's vision as a value. The cornerstones, attention, pay attention, imagination. If you can dream it, you can do it. Articulation, the family farm stays in the family. How do you define your dream? And then belief, believing in it. Thoreau said, build your castles in the air because that's where they belong. Now build foundations under them. That's what vision is all about. But... No matter how grand, especially the grander it is, your vision is, the more you're going to have to be willing to focus your time, your money, your energy on that vision. And that's what core action value number nine is, focus. And we'll get to that next. I'll see you then. <music>